learning. I'm looking forward to learning. As you can imagine, my schedule is a little packed, so I actually have to leave like just five minutes early, but got to wrap up today about 10.55. So looking forward to learning. So having said all that, what I'd like to learn today is something that we may have studied at some point in in our you know years of learning together but um it's always relevant most especially today and that is i wanted to do a little de in-depth study of perke avot and i'll tell you why in a minute it's not just because you know you know i like it and because i think it's important but why why do you think we're studying perke avot right today because um, there's there's a custom to study perke avot between pesach and shavuos Ah, there is a custom across. But I don't. I don't know Jewish why we land. have that custom, but I know we have the custom. There's a custom across Jewish lands to study Pirkei Avot as we speak. Yes. Yeah, so why? Anyone know? Many of the um, teachings are common sense. Okay. Many of the teachings are common sense. Good. Good. Well, there, there's there's. Um... There's six, there's six, there's six, six weeks, there's seven weeks, and there's, there's only six chapters of Pure Kavod, aren't there? Yeah, there are six Shabbatot. Is that, okay, day. six Shabbatot, okay. Six Shabbat, yeah, it's a traditional to study at Friday, Saturday afternoon, um, around sort of, but after Min Shabbat Mincha, before Mariv and Havdala, and if you have, Cedar Leif Shalem for Shabbat and festivals, that's where you find it. And, and in any sort of traditional sitter, right? It's on, if you happen to have the Shabbat version in front of you, it's on page 235, right? Because it's traditional after Shabbat Mincha, in general, just to study and all the more so during these six Shabbatot between Passover and Shavuot, because what are we supposed to be doing between Pesach and Shavuot in general? You count the Omer. Okay, besides counting the Omer, what are we supposed to do? You take a day off on the 33rd day. Isn't that a day to relax from it all? Oh, take a day off. Well, you got to light up the fires of, uh, yeah, go to go Rosh Schechter Day School's inaugural Light the Fire um, to uh, Lagba Omer program. Yes, exactly. Okay, but what else is elevate. supposed to be happening to us? Ah, to elevate. elevate ourselves. We're supposed to elevate ourselves, right? Because we are going from the degradation of Sinai and living as a slave, right? To becoming free people and meeting God at Mount Sinai, right? And we can't just appear to God, right? We have to be prepared and ready to receive God and receive the Ten Commandments, or if you want to say, like, renew our commitment to Torah on Shavuot, right? One of the ways we do that is by staying up all night at the Tikkun Leil Shavuot, right? I think of that as the ultimate cram session, right? Like, we didn't study enough Torah all year, so we have to sort of stay up all night to show God we are worthy. Like, I don't know if you've ever done that before a big exam or before some project was due or a wedding and you didn't finish all the, you know, the goodie bags or whatever else, right? And you stay up all night doing it, right? So part of the, it is perhaps like you weren't worthy, but really it's about, right? It's, it's, am I worthy? How committed am I showing that I am? How ready am I am to receive Torah Mount Sinai? So guess what? One of the other ways that we prepare for receiving God at Mount Sinai Right, and receiving the Ten Commandments. Uh, Bob, I'm going to mute you. I think I'm getting static from you. Sorry. That's okay. Um, right, is by this idea of studying Pirkei Avot. Now, if I'm telling you that we are preparing to meet God and receive the Ten Commandments through the Torah, then why are we studying Pirkei Avot? I mean, shouldn't we be studying Torah? Should we systematically make our way through the Chumash or something else then? Should we pick like the most important, you know, if we're saying that there are sort of six Shabbatot, should we pick the six sort of most consequential, important sections of the Torah to study? Why Pergava? I mean, we didn't really talk about it, but I'm assuming you know about it. But we'll we'll sort of give a little in depth into what Pirkei Avot is in a second. But well, a big a big part of Pirkei Avot is 
is personal improvement. Okay, so a big part of per capita is personal improvement. Okay, maybe. Kind, kind, kind of like Musar. I mean, it's, I, it, I mean, you, ha you have to be individually and as a group ready to receive the Torah. And these are okay, things you'd be working on. Good. Well, let's sorry. Let's define Perkei Avot for a second. What? How would? How do we define Perkei Avot? Translate. Ethics of the fathers. Ethics of the fathers. And yes. the mothers. And the mothers. And too. the mother. Ethics of the mothers too. Okay. Day now what Mother's is? Day. Now what does Perkei mean? Is it sayings? Sayings? No. Ruth says what is, no. What does Perkei mean? Standards. Standards. Uh, no. No, not not teachings, not standards, not ethics. It means chapters. 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 Perek is a chapter. You may have heard of Perek before. Perek in Hebrew means chapters. Perke is a plural form. Yes, Ruth. It's also oh. joints. Joints. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Joints in your hand. Yeah. Like, oh, I never heard that one before. I like that. Okay. Uh, now, oh, you might have given me a new interpretation of Perek about. Right, but literally this means, this is just talking about like the quantity, right? The quantity of learning, right? It's six chapters, right? Remember we said six, six chapters of Avot, which is Elliot. So who would the fathers be? The Zarkanum, the, the wisdom, the- Okay, so right, the here's the question, Hothams. right? Yeah, yeah, so here's the question. It's chapters of fathers. So are we talking about, you know, when we say avot, avot is a loaded term, right? We, I mean, we say it in our tefillot, in our prayers all the time, right? Magen avot, right? There's one example. And we say it all the time. Zelcher chaste avot, right? The shield of our ancestors, the remembering the merit. God should remember the merits of our fathers. So is that, are we talking about the four fathers here were the, who were the three fathers? Are we talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Are the Imahot, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah also folded into that? Is it, as Elliot said, a vote is more like the rabbinic elite, you know, sort of like the, the, the you know, the intellectual leaders of, of prior generations? Is it the early rabbis of the Mishnah? You know, you know, is it right? Who, as Elia called them, they oftentimes referred to as the Zakanim, the elders. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Or is it our own parents? I mean, that Avot are our fathers. Yeah, ready? They're they're intellectual fathers. Ah, I like that. Beautiful. Yeah. So I just wanted to start right. It's it sort of is a loaded title. Or, or it's a, maybe a nuanced title or a textured title that it's unclear just looking at the title of Pirkei Avot, which is also called Mishnah Avot. Of course, there's a second title for this, um, right? There's a, there, it's unclear who the Avot are that we're talking about. And in fact, as we read through and you study, it's, it, it's pretty clear that it's not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it's something closer to the... Um, what did you say, Rene? I liked what you said. Intellectual? Intellectual, intellectual fathers. Intellectual fathers. I like that. Yeah. Well, here or, we've got or, a listing. It says Moses received the Torah. Yeah. Oh, you, you already opened the book. Yeah, we're going to look did. at that. In a second. We're going to look at them for a second. So let's just give a little bit more background. Sorry. So, right, Pirkei Avot, does anyone know the time frame? Like, when was Pirkei Avot written? Anyone know, like, where in Jewish history, if we're going to plop a thing, where was it written and when? Where would you find it? Besides in the Siddur on page 235. Like, where's the original place you would find it? Was it at Yavne? Yavne. Okay. Now, Ruth got really specific. <laughs> really? What, so if you say Yavne, what do you mean by Yavne? It's the, the Knesset Gdola, the Sanhedrin. All right. So the... Right, the Knesset Agadola, which was the, the Sanhedrin or the Great Assembly, sometimes we call it that, right? So these were the rabbi, this was after the Bible was finished. This is sort of the next level of Jewish 
intellectual leaders, right? That sort of took God's message and sort of led the people, right? That was the precursor of the Sanhedrin, the great assembly, which became the Sanhedrin. And they were based in Yavne in Israel, right? That was their physical location. And if you know the story of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, right? That whole story. So the time period is 100. After, what are we talking about? What? After the destruction. The, after the destruction. I'll say approximately 100 CE. Right? That's what we're saying approximately. Does everyone agree that? I mean, I know you're all scholars of Perkei Avot already. Uh, does everyone agree? So, right, you're placing it in the course of the creation of the Mishnah prior to the Talmud. Correct? Maybe. So it's in Israel by the rabbis who were, who or the rabbis of the Mishnah, which is the first major law code following the Bible before the explanation and ex, ex, ex whatever, you know, expansion through the Talmud. Okay. I think that actually sounds pretty good. And that's why it's called Mishnah Evot. All right. Now we're about ready to look at it. Are we about ready? So it is six chapters, by the way. Do you know what? Um, if you've studied Mishnah, or if you're if you're like me and your favorite Passover song is Who Knows One, what is six? Who knows six? Six are the orders of the Mishnah. Six are the orders of the Mishnah. Shisha Shidre Mishnah. Say that three times fast. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Six are the orders of the Mishnah. What does that mean in 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 plain English? But just uh, like the five mean? books of the Torah, there's six books of the Mishnah. Now you're going to have me sing the song. Six of the books of the Mishnah, five of the books of the Torah. Right, exactly. Okay, so, um, right, the Mishnah, right, the main law code following the Bible is divided into six sections, right? That's what we're talking about here, right? That the Mishnah is divided into six sections. Perhaps that is somehow paralleled that Pirkei Avot stands for all the rabbinic writing at the time and the six chapters, six parakim Pirkei Avot are somehow patterned, stand for all of rabbinic writing, which is the expansion of Torah. Do you sort of get what I'm getting at? If we go back to that original thing that I was talking about, that we study Pirkei Avot and the six chapters of of the rabbi's writings, which we didn't say yet, but they are about ethics. That's why you said teachings of the sages and ethics of the sages and those other titles that are for the book, because that's what the content is of the actual book. But perhaps there are six chapters and we read them on the six, we study them on the six Shabbat leading up to Mount Sinai and Shabbat because these six chapters are in essence considered standing for all of the rabbinic corpus. This stands for the entire Shisha Sidre Mishnah, the entire six volumes of Mishnah. Does that make any sense? Okay, having said all of that, right, let's just say, right, you already said, right, it's all so-called ethics of the sages or teachings of the fathers, right, and the mothers, thanks, Lynn, right? And whatever other title we wanna say, that's now contextual. When we actually go and look and read, which we're going to do, we're going to see that the, the core of Perkei Avot are moral and ethical teachings of the greatest rabbis of, of, that, of, of several generations, right? Most Mishnah is law. We've studied it before. What is the time that you say the Shema in the morning, right? How many candles do you, you know, how do you light the candles on, on Hanukkah? Right. Uh, you know, how do you determine a kosher animal? Right. That's it's pretty standard law. This is not standard law. In fact, none of these things that we're going to read are laws. They are moral, ethical principles to live by. Right. By the way, in the Talmud, which happens after the writing of the Mishnah or or teaching of the Mishnah, they the Talmud incorporates these ethical stuff in the midst of the legal stuff and sort of brings them together. But here 
in Perkei Avot, this is the only real part of the Mishnah where it's ethical. Everything else is purely legal. Understand? Question. Yes. So if, if it's about ethics, which is what I assumed it to be, um, would it not, in a sense, be on a higher level than some of the other holy writings? Because standing, uh, teaching uh, whoever it was on one foot, what Judaism is all about, it's how we Hello. treat others, Hello. and would have to relate to ethics. So I would assume that Perke Ovos would be, in a sense, on a higher level than some of the other holy texts. Uh, anyone have an answer to that? Do you know there's a principle about never ranking mitzvot, even though we do it all the time? So have you ever heard that? Wait, never what? Never rank, did you say? Ranking, yeah. Never ranking. saying that one is more important uh. than the other, right? Not considering a one a, a sort of a major mitzvah versus a minor mitzvah or a lighter mitzvah and a heavier mitzvah. The rabbis are very careful about that, right? Number one, they say that, like, only God is the one who can measure that, right? What we think is sort of not so important, maybe God thinks it's more. I'm just giving you the traditional answer, right? Like that's one of these things for shotness. If you heard Linda Newman, right, and she gave a beautiful Devar Torah at the intro to the Torah reading, you know, last she talked about shotness. Actually gave some really interesting reasons why. But like, yeah, shotness to me, it's being recorded, so sorry. Like, uh, to be honest, I'm not like an expert follower of shot. I don't send every suit I buy to the Shatnez lab. Do you know about the Shatnez lab? You know, like there actually are, there's one in Cleveland, right? You can literally bring your suit. And it's just about a, mixing wool and linen. The I know, I know it's about there. mixing, right? But I'm saying I like- I be an expert on shot. Well, oh, yes, yes, sorry, the tailor. Yes, Bob. Yes. So uh, Bob, see, for Bob, it's a really- Consequential, essential mitzvah. Yeah, Bob, go ahead. Okay, so in dealing with a number of Orthodox customers, um, I became an expert on shotness to the point where I had the chemical that you put on the back of a collar to make sure that there was no linen mixed with wool in the garment, the chemical would turn the collar blue if there was linen mixed into the wool or something that was treif mixed into the wool. Wow. There was, there was also garments that had been made overseas where they didn't know the content because it was other contents that were in the under collars or the linings of the suits. And the rabbis would not allow us to sell those garments to Orthodox people. And there were many a suit that I sold that came back with the collar all ripped out. Wow. So, yes, I know all about shotness. Yeah, so as I was saying, like, so this is, a, that, this that is chem, not a mitzvah chemical, that we necessarily... Yeah, go ahead, Ron. That, that chemical you put on the collar that made it turn blue, is that how you make techelet? I was waiting for that one. Yeah, I thought you were going to say, do they, gonna, do they sell that I really in wanted to say, What I really wanted yeah. to say was about your comment about not ranking to um, make mitzvah. vote. Yeah. We, we don't exactly rank them, but there are some that are breakable in order to observe another one. Like you don't have to honor, and we just had that this week. You don't have to honor your mother and father if they tell you to break Shabbos. Yeah, I would, I would think about that one a little bit more. Yeah, that's mom and dad. Said on said your parents are listening. <laughs> Oh, that's what they can. You know, it's a, yeah, I think there's I think there's a nuance that's to it. What he said. I think there's a nuance. How about that? Is that fair? <laughs> Very fair, because I was shocked. Yeah, let's say it's a nuance. There's a nuanced answer. It's a case by case basis. But yeah, there is permission for that. And again, overriding. 
Yeah, by the way, thanks, Bob, for that shot. Now, I really do not know shot as in depth. You know, surprisingly, they don't didn't teach it in rabbinical school to that level. But, you know, as an amateur chemist, now I'm really excited and I'm fulfilling my lineage. Colin user one, my namesake, my dad's dad, Harry, was a tailor and worked at a men's, uh, you know, men's suit store. So I feel like I'm car carrying that on. Um, so thanks, Bob. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to just, you know, so, right, it was a great question. Elliot said, like, aren't these, aren't these laws more important? The, you know, answer number one is we don't know. Answer number two is, right, they're all important. But having said that, you know, then, I'm sorry, we're sort of getting off base. We haven't looked at Perkei vote yet. But, you know, the Ten Commandments themselves, if you look at them, right, you know that they are... Do you know how they are sort of class? There's there's a way to break them in half. Do you know the breaking in half point, making them into two different categories? The Ten the Commandments. Five duties toward Hashem, and the other five right. toward our fellow human being. Right, which we say in Hebrew, right? Ben Adam lechavero and Ben Adam le. What Hashem? I don't even remember. My brain is mush. Makom la makom. Oh, Mama, come. Thank you. Yeah, Ben Adam Lama, come. Thanks, Ruth. I I did know that. Yes, I, that one I learned in rabbinical school. <laughs> um, right. So there are questions again. There, like, what's more important, right? Is it more important that the mitzvot that we have about how we have interpersonal relationships with people, or you know, and that's don't murder, don't steal, you know, don't covet, you know, don't lie. Or is it more important the mitzvot about Shabbat? Is it more important to keep Shabbat, or is it more important to be be a good person? And this was Elliot was sort of implying, right, and asking. Yeah, of course, the the ultimate answer is both. Oh, both, right? A Jew, right, does both. A Jew does both, right? And we, of course, we know people who do one and not the other, right? And and it's it's sort of hard to reconcile, right? So you know, really, this is about both. The Mishnah is very focused on law, and it's interesting to note. It's important to note that Perkei Avot, which by the way is the most studied Mishnah in the world, right? This is the most important tractate that everybody studies. Everybody, you know, it was really everybody studying the intricate laws of, you know, sacrifices in, in Kadashim that are brought or, you know, people are studying the, you know, the tractates of, of Megillah. Yeah, I mean, they read it if they're doing the Dafyomi cycle or if there's something relevant at the moment. But everybody studies Perkei about all the time, continually. So, right. So I don't know if one's more important than the other. They're both required. Okay. We ready to jump in a little bit? Having said all that, got to take a breath. Yes? Sorry sorry for a 28-minute introduction. Um, oh, last thing. <laughs> it's one of those days. Last thing. There are There is a some scholars question whether Perkei Avot is actually dated to the time of the Mishnah. Having said all of that, um, it's not that it's like, Somebody like wrote it a thousand years later and predated, you know, pre oh, like we found like, the, you know, the Zohar, if you know, the mystical book of the Zohar, right, it's, which was written in 1300s and all, you know, scholars can point to it and academics can point to it based on the, the grammar and the vocabulary used and sort of what it's built upon, right? It was written in the 1300s, but it, it's claimed to be written in Mishnaic times by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who was a rabbi who lived in the time of the Mishnah and taught in the time of the Mishnah. That we know was written a thousand years later in Spain by a guy, by a rabbi named Moshe de Leon. And he really just wanted to give more sort of authenticity, right? And put a name on it. Like everybody's gonna, if I write a book, okay, maybe B'nai Yashorin people will read it and maybe Cleveland people will read it and my parents in New Jersey will buy extra copies and give it to their friends and you know maybe a couple other people will read the book but if I like 
claim to write a book, right? And I found the book written by some, you know, great rabbi from a couple hundred years ago, right? I've unearthed this manuscript. You mean your great, 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 great grab? There you go. Yes. Yes. Isaac Luria, right? The great yeah, that's Arizal. That's the one. Yes, the great Arizal. Yes, uh, the great mystic. Yes, I have uncovered it and channeled him and written the book. And it's going to sell a million copies, right? It's going to be a bestseller in the Jewish world. That's what Moshe de Leon did. The Zohar is an amazing book, but he tried to you know, get it more press, right, by, by claiming it was written by a rabbi a thousand years ago. So having said that, there's a thought by many people that Perkei Avot is perhaps not, was not originally part of the Mishnah. They were ethical teachings by the rabbis of the Mishnah, but they weren't necessarily coalesced into an entire thing if that makes sense. Later on, it was not, I mean, not much later on, but you know, a little bit later on, it was decided that the ethical teachings from these great rabbis from the Mishnah were essential and should be put into a book and published alongside the, like just the legal stuff that the ethical principles were important. So these were teachings that existed from that time period, but it's unclear whether they were all coalesced into one, one sort of published, volume if that makes sense so it's not a question of their authenticity it's a question of the whether were they presented in a systematic way like this okay now we're ready to study all right we'll do a little screen sharing we'll do the safari version there's a lot better versions probably but that's that's the easiest one we have okay so someone want to read a little bit we're gonna we're gonna mix and match a little bit anyone want to be a reader today Now I can't see you. I see Sherry. Thanks, Sherry. Maybe the cat will read to, for us too. Okay, let me find it. Okay. So in case you're ever looking and you want to find and you haven't seen us play with Safaria, right? Safaria.org. If you go to the main page, just to show you if my computer actually works, I guess not. It's thinking. You click on this thing, text, and then you go to Mishnah. And then you scroll down to, by the way, if you see here, what part of the Mishnah is it in, right? We said there were six orders or, or parts, right? Order number one is agricultural laws called Zra'im, of which Brachot, blessings, is the first one. And then it's all like actual like farming practices and, and the charity around farming, like peya, leaving the corners of your field and leket and all those things. Right then, it's all the holiday cycle, beginning with Shabbat, and then every single holiday. That's the Mishnah. The third one is Nashim, which are interpersonal family laws, so the laws of marriage, divorce, you know that sort of thing. Then it's Nizikim, which is damages. Right, this is all sort of business law and torts. Then it's Kadosh, Kodashim, which are the sacrificial systems. Then there's Tahara. If you're not muted, you should mute yourself. Then we have purity, Taharot, right? Which is also so more about um, what the what the priests do and personal purification. Those are the six chapters. Now, if you saw all those, nothing really fits with ethical laws here, correct? Maybe purity. I mean sacrifices, maybe, damages and business tort law. How Interpersonal about, law. How about what? Midot. Midot. Yeah, that's not one of the six orders, though. Oh, okay. So right, midot is just general, right? The qualities, right? There's the holidays. There's farming practices, holiday Jewish calendar. There's family law about marriage and that type of stuff. There's damages. There's business law. There's sacrifices, and there's purity. Well, I'll tell you, it's in. Da, 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 da. You can see my spinning. It's in business damage tort law. Very interesting, right? So you can see, right? Or there's the famous Bavas. If you know the Bavas, not the Baba Mises, but Baba Kama, <laughs> Baba Mitzi, and Baba Batra, right? These are all the main damage laws. Then there's laws of Sanhedrin, right? How the courts establish laws of Bakot, which is the laws sort of the punishment, Shvuot, when to make an oath, then how oaths hold. 
eduyot, which is testimony of witnesses. Then there's some interesting ones here. These are like, so it's part of the interesting ones that are added to the laws of damages and business and torts of Odazara, which is, right? It's interacting with idol worshipers, which really is interacting with non-Jews. The rabbis recognized they lived in, even in Israel, they were non-Jews that they lived around, right? So this is how Jews interact, how you do business. This, so it's probably here because it's a lot about business dealings, business dealings with non-Jews. Are you, were you allowed to? How were you allowed to? How you were allowed to sell things to non-Jews? And God forbid if like they were like a, uh, uh, like a Christian bookstore, you know, like they were selling Christian Bibles and like uh, crosses, like how you sort of manage that. Yeah. So that's probably why Avodazara is there. So the next thing is Perkei Avot, right? Short statements on advice, ethics, and wisdom, right? Somehow it's thrown into this tort law. I'll tell you probably why, because there's Sanhedrin, which was the laws of how to judge, right? Eduyot, how to testify, right? So there is stuff about sort of how to be honest and be a leader and make important choices. So that's sort of my two cents. You know, there's a longer reason why it's in the section. Then Horai, oh, which is interesting. Like the last section is atoning for erroneous rulings of the court and inverting sins of leaders. Maybe we need to study that another time soon. Okay. That's all um, the rules for the Innocence Project. Oh, that too. Thank you. Yeah. By the way, there's a program at 10, at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. Since you brought that up, if you see our listing, one of our great teen, teenagers, Ellie Wolf, is very active in Ohio Innocence Project, and she has a panel of speakers speaking at Hawken High School, and it's being zoomed. It's being zoomed so everyone can join that panel. It's a really important organization. Okay. I have a question. Uh, yes, and Lynn and Lynn does too. Yeah. Who goes first? You do, Elliot. Okay. Anyhow, on the vote of Zora, it would seem that in dealing with non-Jews there's an obligation on the part of the Jew to make some sort of judgment as to what sort of non-Jew they are. We'd have to have information about their background, their practices, their beliefs, yeah, so, et cetera. How, yeah, could so, that, how, how could that happen? Right, well, part of this is like, can you, is it kosher to like give money to a non-Jew if you, if you think they're gonna do something idolatrous with it? Like, like there are all of these sort of rules of like, what's the kashrut and how to manage that? Now, I will tell you today, right, we, we live in a different system, right? Like, I, number one, when we say idol worshipers, right, the, the majority of, of non-Jews we interact with, we don't consider in the category of idol worshipers, right? They are Christians and Muslims and go down the list. The majority of people in the world are not how the rabbis classified idol worshipers, you know, and so it's a longer conversation. So I give you like one second answer. Lynn? Mine's real quick. Um, how come back when we you were showing the headings and it listed everything, it had the word Seder in there, but yeah, uh, when it was translated, it never said the word in English, order. And that's, uh, I just, that was- Right, just, yeah, just in translate, as you know, like Seder, right? We call the Pesach Seder a Seder because there's an order to things, right? And our Sidor is the same, actually the same Hebrew word, Seder and Sidor is the same word, or you call it that way because there's an order to the prayer service, right? We have a specific order in which we say pray. I don't know why they didn't translate Seder, but yeah, each okay. is that, but that's what it means is, is that each section of the mission is called a Seder because it's ordered. They are organized, it's organized, right? The rabbis organize it in a special way. Here's my, my last introduction, by the way, they are organized that way because it's actually just length. Always the longest, the one that had the most chapters is first in each order, and then it goes down based by length of section. So even though like the, the one for holidays begins with Shabbat and it's nice because you do Shabbat and then you do all the other holidays, actually just so happens that Shabbat is the longest one. Okay, but that's another story. Sorry, I'm sort of just dumping everything on you right now. Everything I know about Mishnah in 40 minutes by Rabbi Hal. Okay, so you can see here, Sherry, will you read to us the first amazing ethical, you know, text that is presented to us? Moses received the Torah at Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua 
Joshua to the elders, and the elders to the prophets, and the prophets to the men of the great assembly. They said three things. Be patient in the administration of justice, raise many disciples, and make a fence round the Torah. Okay, thanks. Again, like you studied, you may have studied this with me before or not, it's pretty classic. So this great compendium on Jewish ethics, right, begins with what? Moses receiving the Torah. Ah, right. So it begins with Moses receiving the Torah. And then what happens to the Torah? He gets Joshua. passed it off to Joshua. Right. This is the sort of the evolution, the transmission through generations. Right? This is actually a lot of generations here. This is like a thousand years. Right. It, this it, is how. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. It's giving credence to what they're about to say. Ah, this is the this is the authenticity. What, what I never the noticed be, what I never noticed before is it never talks about judges or kings. Doesn't talk about judges or kings, right? Right. These are prophets, and and, and yet they're supposed to administer justice, but it's never right. never the the judges are the judges and the kings aren't included. All right. By the way, neither are the priests or the. That's not a surprise because there, there was, there were the people and there was the priests and it's two. I mean, it's just like the whole book of Leviticus is all about the priests. It's separate. Yeah, it's, se it's a separate. It's a separate cast. Right. So, but yeah, this is very specifically prophets, right? What wh what makes a prophet a prophet? I'm not talking about financial here. Right? Uh, inspiration from God. Right. Somehow God is like channeled through them. Right. They they have some inspiration from God. Right. So and Moses definitely had that. Joshua had it. Right. The elders had it in biblical times, supposedly. The prophets had it. Right. And they make a very quick, subtle, unassuming jump that. Right. Oh, we're talking about all these people that hash God literally spoke to. Right. And then they go. What's the last one? Men of the Great Assembly. So what's the implication? The skipping the kings. That's what Ron just said, right? They're skipping all that stuff, right? This is giving the stamp of approval that the men of the great assembly, who is the precursor of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin, who are the lead, who are the rabbis that we're talking about and going to talk about for the next ch six chapters and made the Mishnah and made the Talmud, if they are equivalent to, what are they equivalent to? Moshe. Right. At least what they have is part of Moshe. At least what they're, they're carrying on Moses's legacy. I'm not saying that they are. I don't think anyone is saying here that they talk to God or God talks to them. But Rabbi, they who, have the, qual who qualified to become members of the Sanhedrin? I'll answer that. So we, I guess we got to have to read Seder, you know, Nazikin and read Mishnah Sanhedrin. But um, just right. This is the stamp of authority. Right? How do we know that the rabbis of the Mishnah are transmitting, right? the laws of God, the interpretation of God, right? How do we know how they're interpreting the Torah? Because this is really, the mission is the first legal interpretation of the Torah. The Torah is not expansive. The Torah gives very short one-liners of how to live life, how to follow God's commandments. Mm -hmm. This is the expansion. This is actually, you know, it says, get married, right? It says, man takes a, a man takes a woman as his wife. That's all it says. I mean, there's like a lot of other intricacies into getting married and what it means to get married, right? Even just the laws of, of marriage. I mean, I spent several months in rabbinical school studying those laws, right? There's literally one line in the Torah. A man takes his wife to be, to be his, a man takes a woman to be his wife. That's all. Now you can talk about it says acquire, but that a man acquires a, a woman as his wife. But like there's, you know, which is interesting. But that's it, right? This is the expansion. How do we know that that expansion that the rabbis did a thousand years later is kosher? Because of this. Because of this. 
And it's interesting that the Mishnah itself doesn't begin with this, right? The Mishnah just jumps into the laws, right? If you've studied with me before, we said, right, the first Mishnah is about Shabbat. I'm sorry, about the Shema. What time do you say the Shema at night? Doesn't give any intro, doesn't give any good and welfare, doesn't present who we are, who are saying this. It's understood. Maybe this should be the actual introduction to the entire Mishnah. What do you think? It's and the chain, the chain of transmission. Right, that's what that's what the, we normally the, call the, it. The, Thank you. The supply line, so to speak. Yes, yes. Can I read to you the commentary from? If you have the the uh, the one from Cedar Leif Shalem, at the opening of this, we find an ancient mythic picture of transmission, a portrait of a Jew in one generation or another being handed a treasure made of words foundational questions and thoughts and passing it on across time to generations that he or she will never meet, yet he or she feels close to them and responsible for them. This treasure passed from one generation to another always compromises two complementary components, a body and its clothing. The body is the written Torah, the sacred scriptures assembled by the ancients. The clothing is the oral Torah, the people's responses echoing at the encounter with scripture. In that encounter, the voice of every generation weaves itself into the fabric of conversation that came before or is yet to come. All of these generations are constantly at work deciphering God's ongoing revelation to humankind. The first teaching of Pirkei Evo provides us with a mythical picture of continuous transmission and participation. In this state of soul called Sinai, we encounter a spiritual continent in search of meaning, inspiration, and purpose where God and people meet, which is called Torah. That's from Rabbi Tamar Elad Applebaum. That's like the more spiritual, uh, metaphorical commentary. Do you want the more tachless commentary? Yeah. This is by Gordon Tucker. This is the other side of the page, Rabbi Gordon Tucker. What we see here should be seen for what it is, a significant and far-reaching change in the definition of religious truth. From the point of view of biblical Judaism, there's a truth that can be gotten only through a prophet or perhaps through the priestly breastplate. But here, each generation is assumed to have had one or more persons who would be regarded as having authority, precisely because they were the recipients of authentic tradition from previous generation. The members of the great assembly, who were they? The simple answer is we do not know. Reflecting this nebulous, nebulousness is the fact that various traditions describe membership in this body to figures of such diverse temporal and geographic providence as Zachariah, Daniel, Ezra, Mordechai, Shimon the Righteous, not all of whom can themselves confidently be assigned a historical date or who may not have overlapped in their lifetime together. The most likely understanding of who the Anshe Knesset Agadola, the men of the Great Assembly, were is that they are a mythic way of treating a period of significant transition. This very Mishnah includes another of those nebul neb nebulous figures, the Zakanim, the elders, who affect the transition from the foundation generation of the Exodus and conquest, Moses and Joshua, to the time when the people of Israel settled in the land and prophets arise, but who are not mentioned by name. Thus, the transition chronicled here from the immediacy of the biblical period to that ongoing continuous oral tradition is marked by an otherwise unknown body. This existence did not create the transition, but rather consciousness of the transition created this body. All right, those are both pretty deep. All right, do you, do you want me to, to, to break that heaviness and tell you a Gordon Tucker story? Yes. Um, so Eric and I have uh, several people that claim to be the reason that we got married and got together. In fact, almost every friend of ours claims to have set us up. Uh, but the truth is it was Gordon Tucker. The truth is it was Gord Rabbi Gordon Tucker, who at the time was the rabbi of Temple Israel of White Plains, but is considered like one of the greatest, you know, one of the most intelligent and leading rabbis of the generation. He was a, you know, he was a visiting professor at JTS, and uh, Erica was finishing her master's at JTS in Columbia, and I was in rabbinical school, and uh, we both took his class on ethics. I will tell you, 
There were classes where neither of us understood at all what he was teaching. He was like, so, I like, so, you know, I couldn't get there, couldn't understand it. So we would commiserate together about what is Rabbi Tucker talking about? Like, where, I could do not understand. So many people claim to have set us up, but uh, I always think Rabbi Tucker had a little part of it. And, and the Ketubah text that I use mostly, his Rabbi Tucker wrote what I consider the best egalitarian Ketubah text. And it is his Ketubah, which by the way, he wrote at lunch with two friends on a cocktail napkin. Um, he did really, it's the story is true. Um, that Ketubah text is of course the Ketubah text that we used and is hanging on our wall. And I use with almost every couple that I marry, I give them options. So uh, I have a lot to thank Gordon, Rabbi Tucker for. Okay, Rabbi, that was a, that a, was a sidebar, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I make a comment about that? A Kabbalist, on a, taking what you said on a Kabbalistic level and reminiscing of what was said at my wedding, and you probably heard about this, it wasn't uh, what you said, but ultimately 40 days before a person is born, a bot kol or a voice from heaven announces who they will marry. Now, maybe you can align the two, your portion of that with the, for, the bot kol portion on the Kabbalistic level. Well, I don't know if I'm ready to go that high, but yeah. Right. By, by the way, bot kol is how the rabbis deal with the idea that sometimes they like sort of need a divine in, in inspiration, but they didn't really believe that you got divine inspiration anymore. And that's the classic, I'll stop share for a second, right? That's the, that's the classic story of Hillel and Shammai, right? and they disagree and disagree and disagree, and right, who's right, right? A bot call, a voice from heaven. But sometimes is, is written in the Talmud as literally a piece of paper comes down from the sky with the answer. So it's not that they actually like heard a voice. Sometimes it's like, I don't know, I guess it's pretexting or whatever. You know, they didn't get a text from God. Literally, a piece of paper comes down with a, with the answer and they, oh, of course God sent us the answer. Right. So I don't do I believe in bot call? I'm I'm all I can say is this. I'm listening and I'm ready. It's a beautiful if, like, if God song. wants to do it. Yeah. Okay. So I want to get back to Sherry because I, I got to wrap up and we actually have to learn a little bit here. So Sherry, you taught us not only the transmission and the authentic, the authority that the rabbis now have to carry on the, the Torah, right? That, that this is equivalent to Torah, correct? So we already, the, what are the first three ethical teachings that we have? You said it before, right? Be patient in the administration of justice, raise many disciples, make offense around the Torah. Now, if I was gonna pick three, you know, what are the three most important ethical teachings of Judaism, are these any of the three? What do you think? Could we think of better ones? The next chapter. The next chapter, right? We're going to get there. Like, yes, there are better ones to come. So it's just interesting. Now, mind you, if we look at the fact that we're talking about these are the early stages of the rabbis, right? These are sort of what we call proto-rabbinic times. Now that sounds like big, you know, get into these big academic things. You know, like this is like before the rabbis became what we know of the rabbis today. It makes sense, right? What's the first thing that they're saying? Be patient in the administration of justice, right? Don't be rash in your decisions, right? And let justice play out. And right, that you shouldn't force a judge to make a hasty decision. Raise many disciples, right? We want to expand the number of rabbis that there are, right? And make a fence around the Torah, which we've taught before means, right, we want to be very careful to never feel like we are encroaching on anything that would be close to breaking a Torah law, right? The Torah is the most sacred thing there is, right? Later on, we'll see, and just because I have to leave in a minute, Right, the world stands on three things. This one we know pretty well, right? On Torah, on worship, on acts of piety, right? That um, 
you know, I'll just show you. My favorite one is, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of favorites. This is not my favorite one. Too much conversation with women causes men to do evil, right? We're gonna skip that one, right? Uh, right, this is, one, this is one of the best ones, right? Right, right? Right, right. Set for yourself a teacher, acquire yourself a friend, right? Judge all people with the you know as as they are innocents, right? With with merit, right? So we're gonna stop here. So thank you for learning with me. Let me stop the share. Sorry, I have to stop early. Sorry, I gave you a really long introduction. I guess you can tell I like Pirkei Avot a lot. <laughs> I like Pirkei Avot a lot. We have set for ourselves yeah. a teacher by acquiring you as our oh. exemplary teacher. Oh, you're the best, Elliot. Thank you. Amen. Beautiful. Right, but we, we put, should... We put yeah, that on the canvas plaque. We actually yeah, put that it's a, it's a, Yeah, it's one of the best things you can do. Perfect. So... Thank you for studying with me. I will. So let me, I know I have to leave. Um, I, so someone asked me, yes, I, I plan to keep doing this class because as you know, I'm very bit busier now than I anticipated, but it's probably going to be sort of like an every other week prospect just for the time being, because I'm overloaded at the moment. So um, as of now, next week, there is no class, but we'll meet in two weeks. So stay tuned. If you please come back, because I love learning with you. But if you'll just sort of give me a little bit of time to juggle everything. Um, so no class as of now, no class next week, but class the following week, and we'll sort of just go probably every other week for a little bit, and then we'll find it get back into our consistency. But don't leave because I love learning with you. Rabbi, you that should love, be posted on the website. That should yeah, be yeah, that yeah. We're we're getting there. Confused. It is in process. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. Bye.